Today, we continue a series that we started last week called Unashamed, and we're looking at what shame is in our lives, and we talked about last week in this series that we begin addressing shame, that shame is something that every one of us carry, and that every one of us have at some extent, and it's been humanity's nemesis since the beginning of time. If you, to un- if, if you will with me, we, to understand shame We need to go back to the beginning of time and realize something about shame. See, shame was not part of God's perfect creation. When God was beginning and and he was creating everything, and and for as as Christ followers, we look at scripture as God's inspired uh, truth to us, revealed to us. And in this, in our scripture, we have this this book, this this narrative, this, this poem, if you will. It actually was a very creative piece that the Israelites had for for years. It was a part of what they called the Pentateuch. And in this, the author, possibly Moses at the time, is, is who gets the most credit for it. God inspired this writer to write the creation story of what it was like when before, before you and I were here. And in this narrative, he talks about how there's different stages of creation. And in the day one, he created. And then day two, he created, declared it was good. Day three, he created, declared it was good. Day four, day five, day six, he gets to creating and man was created. And on day six was the first day that he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so man gets this helpmate, the wife, comes into the play, God creates a woman, and there he says it was good. And in this marriage, in this institution that God ordains here at the beginning of time, this, this, with man and, and the woman, God says something and inspire and inspires the writer of Genesis to say something about that beginning time. Look what it says here. And Adam and his wife were both naked. That is so inspiring, isn't it? The first service laughed. (laughs) You guys didn't get the humor in that. No, he says Adam and his wife were both naked, but, but I want you to see what he says there. And they felt no shame. I don't know if this was a poetic way for the writer to say, hey, you know what, being naked was, was this, this, this very way to say, yeah, they didn't have clothes. We all know that because, you know, clothes didn't come till later in time. But it was this reality that there was no shame. That, that they had not, that, that there was a perfect union with God at this moment. There was not only a perfect union with God, but there was a perfect union with each other. Man and woman were connected together with each other. There was no shame among them, and there was no shame in their relationship with God. But mankind's desire to have all the power and all the comfort, and, and, and because man's kind had that desire to, to be in control and, and they, su- they, they surrendered to the temptation to be God and ignore the truth that they were already made in the image of God and God set a limit for them not to go beyond and they do and in that sin breaks a connection with God and sin comes into the scene and breaks the connection between man and woman because that's what sin does. Sin disconnects us. And shame is the result of that sin and, the, and, and we feel the consequence of shame too because it's that painful feeling of losing something. It's that painful feeling of losing honor. It's a painful feeling of losing that relationship. It's that painful feeling of losing that opportunity or that success. It's that painful feeling of loss and disconnection. It's a painful feeling of losing your respect or losing character and my integrity. But in order to understand shame completely, last week we talked about that there are two different types of shame. There's a healthy shame that we experience, that that in our English language we, we only have one word for shame, but most other languages have two. So there's a healthy shame, but there's an unhealthy shame. And healthy shame, write this in, healthy shame is the result of realizing that we are not God and therefore we are limited. That's a healthy place to be. To realize, just like Adam and Eve realized in that moment where they we had, felt no shame, that there was a limit to what they 
could know and there is a limit to what they could do and that they were not God. There was someone else. There's one person that can be God and there's no other God in that place other than God. And there's a healthy shame in realizing those limits because healthy shame is understanding that you can't know it all, you can't do it all, you can't have it all, and you can't be it all. That's a healthy shame. There's also a healthy shame in, in, in recognizing that, 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 man, there's a healthy guilt that, that comes along and can be a guide and a guard in our life. That through possibly the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives, there's a healthy shame that comes around that allows us to set up healthy boundaries physically, healthy boundaries sexually, healthy boundaries emotionally, and healthy boundaries for us relationally. The healthy shame does that. But we also talked about how shame can go toxic on our life. And it can become toxic and begin to poison our soul. And here's what toxic shame is. Toxic shame is this. It's one of Satan's major destructive forces to distort and destroy our identity in Jesus. Shame is a consequence of sin, yes. And left uncovered, left hidden, it can turn toxic in our life and begin to poison our souls. Now let me be clear with something today. Shame cannot destroy your salvation, but it can destroy the joy of your salvation. It can't take away your salvation. Shame can't do that. But it can, it can remove the life that Jesus wants you to experience and the joy that he wants you to experience through the life that he gives us. See, toxic shame can distort and begin to destroy our identity of who we believe and really know and understand who we are. Toxic shame can then shackle us into this dark dungeon and keep us hidden and imprison us into believing, that's, believing something about ourselves that is not true. And that's why the series big idea that we're looking at over these several weeks is this right here, write it in, that the truth of who we are in Jesus removes our toxic shame and gives us courage to be honest with God, ourselves, and others. See, the truth of who you are in Jesus, is, it, it's, it, it's about knowing who you are, your identity, and not who you think you are. And not who others think you are, but who God says you are. And then we believe that, I believe that if, when we begin to realize and understand and grab a hold of that, that our identity of who we are in Jesus, it will begin to, to give us courage to come to God, courage to boldly come before the one that we need most, God himself, and be honest with him. And then be honest with ourselves, which sometimes being honest with yourself, honestly, if, you're gonna, if we're gonna be real together, that can be the hardest person for me to be honest with, is being honest with myself. And then that will lead me to have the courage to be honest with the people around me, sometimes those that are closest to me. And so in this series, and maybe today, if you're here and you're dealing with toxic shame, this is what I, my prayer is for you. I pray that as today, that you find freedom from your toxic shame, beginning that you begin to find freedom from this toxic shame that can so shackle you down. And then I pray that you begin to find healing by knowing who Jesus is and who you are in him. And then for those of us that might not be dealing with toxic shame, this is what I hope for you. I hope that you begin to identify and you can start to see the people around you who might be dealing with toxic shame so you can help them see who they are in Jesus, so you can help them see what truth says to them and you can help them have the courage, maybe possibly for, through your own story and through the story of scripture that they can have the courage to be honest with God themselves and uh, each other and they can find healing for their selves, their souls. And you can be a voice in their life because we all have voices. We all have voices that speak to us. And sometimes the voice that is inside of our heads that, that only you know, that you wake up in the morning and when you're in the shower, that voice begins to talk to you. And, 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 and I'm not talking about the simple, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking the voice that, that, that we are, that we allow our soundtrack to, to kind of morph into. And sometimes that soundtrack is that MP3 on repeat that just constantly begins to tell us 
and we believe and, and, it, and it's shaped from many different voices. It might, might be shaped from what your parents said about you or something your, a, a mom or a dad said to you. And that shame that, that you felt in that moment, maybe it was in a public setting or maybe it was something that you can never measure up to and, and that just becomes your soundtrack and you begin to believe it. Maybe it wasn't a parent, maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a voice of, of a relative, a grandparent. Maybe it was a voice of a child. And, and there was something that, that you never measured up to. There was something that you never became a part of. And, and you never f- found worth or value. And they constantly allowed this. And this, they, they were voices in your life that played on the soundtrack of your mind. It was on like a repeat. And it repeats in your head every day. See, toxic shame can cause our inner voice to say things like this. I'm never blank enough. Now, I don't know what your never blank is, but what is it? Maybe you need to write it down right now. Maybe you need to fill in that blank and no cheating on the neighbor beside you. But, But what is your never blank enough? What's that voice that constantly is shame-based and it's the product of the shame, the, the toxic shame in our life that becomes our identity? And it's I'm never blank enough. Maybe it's hard for you to write that down because shame, it won't want you to write that down. That's what shame wants you to do. Shame wants you to hide it. Shame doesn't want it to come out into the light. See, shame finds life in the darkness and in the deepness of our hearts and our souls and shame doesn't want you to expose it. See, shame has been causing us to hide those things that identify us, that are toxic and it causes us to repress them and it causes the things that that we've done in our past that, that we don't want anybody to know about that have identified us and therefore have driven us to say, I'll never be blank enough or something that's been done to us, or something that, that, that maybe not been done to it, but we're just connected with, and, and it becomes shame, and we want to hide, it and we push it back down inside because we never want it to be in the light. And it's something that's been going on since the beginning. We see it in the story with Adam and Eve. Read this with me. See, as soon as they discovered that there was a limit to what they should do, when, they, when they, they took, stepped outside of God's control and tried to take control of their own life, sin comes into the, 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 into the scene and, and then all of a sudden something happens. Look what happens here. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. See, this is the same thing that we had before there was no shame. They, the, the author says they were naked, but they felt no shame. But now, because of sin, They knew something. They knew there was a consequence now. They're aware of it. They see themselves. They're exposed for who they really are in this moment. And they were naked. And so what do they do? They sew fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, this is not because I believe God really didn't know where they were and they were good at playing hide and seek. This is the first hide and seek game we have in history. And it's not because they were good at this. God knew exactly where they were. God wanted them to know where they were. Adam, Eve, where are you? Why are you hiding? (laughs) And look what Adam says. I heard something. I knew it was you coming because you come every day. I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. So I hid. I was afraid. Why was I afraid? Because I was naked and because I was naked, I hid myself. Isn't that what happens to us? All of a sudden, we go beyond a limit, said, and then we're exposed. The thing that happens when we're exposed is fear. 
And sometimes that what that fear does is not most, sometimes, most of the time that fear drives me to hide. I wanna cover it up. I wanna, I wanna make the fig leaves. I wanna, put, I wanna cover my face. I don't want anybody to see anything's going wrong in my life. I don't want anybody to see I've messed up. I don't want my boss to know. I don't want my spouse to know. I don't want others to know what's going on in our marriage. I don't want anybody to know. I want to cover it up. Because that's what shame does. Is shame pushes us to hide. Yes, we sin. Yes, we, we, we do things. When we go beyond that mark, shame comes in and left uncovered. Shame will cause this toxicity to come inside of us and cause us to drive it deeper and deeper and deeper down into the depths of our soul so nobody else can see it. And you see the progression here? I was naked, I was exposed, I was vulnerable. Therefore I hid, I mean, therefore I was afraid. And because I was afraid, I hid. Why do we hide? Because we're afraid. What are we afraid of? We're afraid of being alone. We're afraid of not being loved. Are we afraid of not having worth or value. See, I think it's interesting that Adam and Eve, they feared the one that they needed the most. And sometimes that's what we get to. Sometimes we fear God and God's the very one we need the most. Sometimes the people that we fear are the people that are, are the ones there that, that we fear that we're not gonna be accepted, but they're the ones that are gonna prove that we are. And sometimes that toxic shame, what it does in our lives is this, write it in, that it, toxic shame makes us hide from others and hide from God. It'll make you hide. Just like Adam and Eve, it'll, it'll cause you to hide and you'll, you'll not want anybody to see what you're going through, what you're thinking, what you're dealing with, what's been done to you, what's going on in your life because of the fear behind it. So I wanna ask you a question. What is it? What are you hiding from others and trying to hide from God? What is it? If you know immediately, you can write it down. I'm not gonna ask you to turn this in, right, on, on their paper. But what is it? What is it you're trying to hide? What is it that shame's trying to say, hey, be afraid of this because if, if you expose this, you're not gonna be loved. If you expose this, you're not, you're not going to be wanted or people are not gonna want you. Your wife's not, your spouse is gonna love you or want you. In his book that Ed Welch writes, it's called Shame Interrupted. And he writes it in the subtitles, How God Lifts the Pain of Worthlessness and Rejection. This is what he says, toxic shame, and, and this is an adaptation of that, so it's not word for word, but this is an adaptation of this. This is what he says, and he defines toxic shame, and this is what I want to define toxic shame as. Toxic shame creates a deep, deep sense that I am unloved and unaccepted because of something I've done, something done to me, or something associated with me. See, that's what toxic shame is going to push you to hide. It's going to push you to hide what's been done to you. It's going to it's going to push you to hide the things that that. Um, that, that somebody else has done and maybe in abusing you. And abuse is when somebody uses you in a way that you weren't designed. And when somebody uses you in a way that you weren't designed, it, it, toxic shame will go into your life and it'll become your identity and make you believe that it's even your fault. That the reason nobody loves you and, and the reason that, 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 that they used you is because you're not acceptable and you're not lovable. Toxic shame will cause us to, to even begin to say and believe that, that because of my past, of what I've done, nobody will accept me. Nobody will love me, much less God he won't love me and he won't accept me. See, that, that's what toxic shame says to us. It's, it, it says that, that it'll cause you to believe that you're unloved and unacceptable because of something so, that, that, that you've done in your past. And then it'll cause us 
to believe that we're not loved or accepted because of something that's associated with us. Maybe something that someone did in your family that brought shame on your family's name and now you feel that shame. And, and there's a fear that you want to hide it. And, and in these things, when, when, when we deal with the shame, what happens is, is we want to push it down and, and we want to push it down inside. And, and these, these tapes begin to play in our set and that they'll say, I'll never be blank enough. And in our world, we'll begin to think that. And when we're around the group or we're around our, our work, our, our, our colleagues at work or we're around our spouse and they, and they begin to bring up a subject that brings up that shame or they say a word that makes us flash back, all of a sudden we go into hiding. We hide behind our phones at dinner. We, we hide uh, in our email at work or, we, or when they begin to talk about something and, and it's that sensitive topic, you, you look for the way out and you begin to hide because of the shame that shackles us. Because our identity becomes distorted and the toxic shame of the things that we've done maybe or the same things that we're associated with or even the things that have done to us outside of our permission. And that shame will cause us to feel, and I want you to see this. See, toxic shame makes me feel, even believe, write this in that I am worthless and alone. It'll make you feel like you have no value. It'll make you feel like nobody loves you and it'll make you feel like you're there all alone. It'll have that, that you're not worthy to be loved by anyone because if you were, then they would. And then what happens in this, much of what we do and much of what we pursue is to pursue that worth and that connectedness. Men, much of what we do and we pursue in life can be driven by toxic shame that says, hey, you know what, you need to be more successful because when you're more successful, people will value you. When you're more successful, when you, when you have more credentials, when you have more trophies or you have more accolades, then people will say that, that you have value. And women... One of the major ways toxic shame can get into your life and bind you is by thinking that, that, that you'll be more loved when you're more beautiful. That you'll be more loved when you're more perfect. That, that you'll, your spouse will, will love you more. That, that, that you'll be, you won't be alone. And the reason you're alone is because you're not enough of something. And it, it, we create these if-win statements we, we create these formulas then that says, hey, if I lose 15 pounds, when I get a degree, when I, I become my own boss, when I can, what, if I can, when I can, if I can, and we play these prerequisites, if you will, in our heads, then we begin to say, no, but you know what, if I can just keep it a secret, If no one finds out, my kids don't find out, my parents don't find out. See, write this in your notes. Toxic shame creates prerequisites to being worthy and loved. That's what toxic shame will do. If we can have a baby together, when I get my MBA. See, there's prerequisites involved and these prerequisites, they, they, they leave us believing that we'll never have what it takes to be loved, to be worthy of love or to be worthy to be accepted. And here's the reality. When you do lose that weight, when you do all these things, when you get that degree, Many of us have already proved that when you get those things that you felt like you needed, there's just a craving for another one because that's what toxic shame does. It makes you look for identity and what, what you shouldn't have identity in. I've asked some people to come up here with me, but I need two more people. So I'm gonna put two people on the spot, Sarah and Carly. <laughs> You're like, never sitting here again.
Come up here and just find a spot in line. You'll know what to do. Shame creates prerequisites. As we begin to compare ourselves and, and we look at what we have or what we don't have and, and we begin to see what other people have that we don't have and, we, and the things that we don't want that other people have and, and the things that other people need from us that we don't have and we, we, we begin to feel the shame from that sometimes. And then we begin to say that I'm never blank enough. Now earlier I told you to fill it in if you could. I want you to fill it in again. But what is the I'm never enough for you? Is it that I'm never good enough? And because you're never good enough, you begin to put this and you begin to hide behind this fear that you're never good enough? That you'll never be the good enough dad or the good enough boss or the good enough employer. You'll, you, you'll never be the good enough husband or the good enough wife. You're never good enough as a parent. What about I'm never thin enough? I'm never pretty enough. What is it? Is it I'm never strong enough or I'm never fast enough or I'll never perform at the level enough to be accepted and feel loved? Is that I'm not perfect enough and, you, and we hide behind this and, and we begin to, begin to do things because we feel like we're not perfect enough and it's all hiding behind this shame-based voice in our head that says we're not smart enough? Is it that we're not popular enough, we're not liked enough, we're not retweeted enough on Facebook, we're never enough to fit in? We begin to hide. Is that you're not talented enough, not disciplined enough, you don't have enough of what it takes to be successful enough? That you're not wealthy enough, you're, not, you're rich enough, you're not secure enough, you're not educated enough, there's not enough letters at the back of your name to be accepted and belong. And all of a sudden, we listen to these voices and it becomes the tape in our head and in, we, I'm never whatever it is for you enough. And it leaves us ashamed. But that's not the voice of truth. Truth tells me something so different. Truth tells me something that is so powerful that, that no voice can, 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 can deny this because this is the voice that cuts through that and brings life and brings freedom. We see it in scripture. We see this, that, that this I'm never enough can be canceled out by the truth of who we are in Jesus. See, when we put shame on us, when I put shame on me, I am covering up what I don't want anyone to see because I'm afraid of not feeling worthy to be loved or feeling worthy to belong. And that's what toxic shame wants us to believe, that you'll never be enough for God. Never be enough for God to accept you and give you a place to belong or give, love you because you'll never be enough. But that's not the voice of truth. This is the voice of truth. In Ephesians 1, this letter to a church in Ephesus, this is what Paul says. For he chose us. Stop right there. I'm never enough. Wait a second. Yes, you are. You're chosen. <laughs> You're chosen. You can remove that, 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 that shame because you are chosen. You, God has chose us in him before the creation of the world. That means before those voices ever begin to tell you that you're not enough and you begin to believe that you're not enough, that you can believe that God has chosen you from be the beginning of time. Before you ever had a past, before you ever messed up, before you ever began to cover your shame, before you ever made those mistakes, before you went through that divorce, before you went through that miserable time, before that happened to your family, God chose you. Before the creation of the world, he knew you. 
and he chose you to be holy and blameless, to be complete, to be like God, just like it was in the creation, made in the image of God. He wants you to find your, restore you into that, to be holy and blameless. You know what blameless means? Without blame. That there's no condemnation on you. That, that, that you can stand before God with no blame in the game. And this is the way he chose you, knowing all of this about you. Knowing all of this about your hurts, your hangups, and those habits that you allowed to destroy your own life. He still chose you and calls you to be blameless and, and chose you to be blameless before the world began. In his sight, he sees you as blameless. You know what shame wants to do to you? Shame wants you to feel the blame and hide it. But God chose you before the world began and to be blameless in his sight. You might see yourself as I'm never enough, but he says, I see you as holy because of Jesus. And that's what he says, in love. In love, he predestined. In love, in love that you are loved. And this is, I want you to get, I don't want you to get hung up on that word predestined. You know what that means? He determined before you ever messed up, before you ever met, were suffered from the consequence of sin, before we ever were born, he determined ahead of time to allow his love to be on display to reconnect us with God. In his love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. Something that you and I can't choose, but something that we can only receive by putting our trust in Jesus. And we come into his family. We have a place to belong. We are adopted into a family, a place to belong because he loves us and he chose us through Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. That he enjoys you. It's to his praise and his, of his glorious grace which he has freely given, not freely and not that you have to merit it, not that you have to earn it and you have to be good enough. See, no, 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 no. He has freely given us in the one he loves. This is the teaching big idea that I want you to understand. See, that voice that's in your head says, I'm never blank enough, but the voice of truth says, I am enough. I am enough for God to love me. I am enough for God to want to have a relationship with me, that there's no prerequisite for me to have a relationship with God, that, that he sets that, that he chose me before I ever, and that he, I am enough. That, that I am enough. Because God chose me and loves me, I am enough. Because I am enough, I don't have to beat myself up for not being good enough and not perfect enough. Because I am enough uh, to be loved by God, I don't have to be, try to be thin enough to be accepted by others. Because I'm enough for God to take pleasure in me, I don't have to strive to perform enough to be strong enough or act like I've got it all together. Because I'm enough, I don't have to worry about being smart enough eloquent enough or clever enough because I'm enough for God to accept me. I don't have to be popular enough, be liked enough or strive to fit in because I am already in because of Jesus. I'm enough because God says I'm enough. And that's our hope. And I want that to be your hope. Don't put a prerequisite to your relationship with God, realize that God has made a way for you just to receive his love and trust and put your hope in the truth that because of Jesus, and because of God's love, you are enough. David, a man in the Old Testament, had many reasons to carry toxic shame and did it sometimes. He wrote a psalm that I want to direct us to again today. We read it last week. He says, In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. 
no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Today, I want to ask you, are you hoping or are you hiding? Are you hiding behind that soundtrack in your head that says, I'm never enough? Are you hiding those things that have been done to you or that are associated with you or maybe you've done in your past you don't want anybody to find out? Are you hoping that those who trust in Him will never be put to shame? We gave you a bag when we walked in. This is what I want you to do. I want you to write down on that bag maybe the same thing that you wrote in that blank, I'm never blank enough. Or maybe there's something that you've been ashamed of and and you've been hiding and you've been hiding and and you're sick of hiding it. And today, you just want to write it down because this is the shame that maybe it's been that part of your past because it's something you've done and you haven't done. Or maybe it's a part of your past or maybe it's a part of something that's associated with you. It's brought shame and, and you've been hiding it. Or maybe... Maybe it's been something that's done to you. You've been carrying the shame. You've been hiding under it. Maybe it's that voice that, that recklessly plays in our head that says you're never enough. Will you write that down? This is what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song. And in this song, it, it, it begins to say, come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted. Let rescue begin. And then it's going to get to the chorus. And in that chorus, it's going to say, so lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. Today, will you bring that piece of paper if you feel led to do so? And when we get to that chorus and we begin to sing, we just come and lay it down. This is the reason why. Trusting in God's truth that I am enough is the beginning it's the beginning of being set free from my toxic shame